The Great War by Winston Churchill Chapter 1 Milestones to Armageddon If the reader is to understand this tale, and the point of view from which it is told, he should follow the author's mind in each principal sphere of causation. He must not only be acquainted with the military and naval situations as they existed at the outbreak of the war, but with the events which led up to them. He must be introduced to the admirals and to the generals. He must study the organisation of the fleets and armies, and the outlines of their strategy by sea and land. He must not shrink even from the design of ships and cannon. He must extend his view to the groupings and slow-growing antagonisms of modern states. He must contract it to the humbler but unavoidable warfare of parties and the interplay of political forces and personalities. The Victorian Calm In the year 1895, I had the privilege, as a young officer, of being invited to lunch with Sir William Harcourt. In the course of a conversation, in which I took, I fear, none too modest a share, I asked the question, what will happen then? My dear Winston, replied the old Victorian statesman, the experiences of a long life have convinced me that nothing ever happens. Since that moment, as it seems to me, nothing has ever ceased happening. The growth of the great antagonisms abroad was accompanied by the progressive aggravation of party strife at home. The scale on which events have shaped themselves has dwarfed the episodes of the Victorian era. Its small wars between great nations, its earnest disputes about superficial issues, the high keen intellectualism of its personages, the sober, frugal, narrow limitations of their action belong to a vanished period. The smooth river with its eddies and ripples, along which we then sailed, seems inconceivably remote from the cataract down which we have been hurled and the rapids in whose turbulence we are now struggling. I date the beginning of these violent times in our country from the Jameson's Raid in 1896. This was the herald, if not indeed the progenitor, of the South African War. From the South African War was born the Khaki election, the protectionist movement, the Chinese labour cry, and the consequent furious reaction and liberal triumph of 1906. From this sprang the violent inroads of the House of Lords upon popular government, which by the end of 1908 had reduced the immense liberal majority to virtual impotence, from which condition they were rescued by the Lloyd George budget in 1909. This measure became, in its turn, on both sides, the cause of still greater provocations, and its rejection by the Lords was a constitutional outrage and political blunder almost beyond compare. It led directly to the two general elections of 1910, to the Parliament Act and to the Irish struggle, in which our country was brought to the very threshold of civil war. Thus we see a succession of partisan actions, continuing with intermission for nearly 20 years, each injury repeated with interest, each oscillation more violent, each risk more grave, until at last it seemed that the sabre itself must be invoked to cool the blood and passions that were rife. Lord Salisbury Retires In July 1902, Lord Salisbury retired. With what seems now to have been only a brief interlude, he had been Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary since 1885. In all those 17 years, the Liberal Party had never exercised any effective control upon affairs. Their brief spell in office had only been obtained by the majority of 40 Irish nationalist votes. During 13 years, the Conservatives had enjoyed homogeneous majorities of 100 to 150. In addition, there was the House of Lords. This long reign of power had now come to an end. The desire for change, the feeling that change was impending, was widespread. It was the end of an epoch. Lord Salisbury was followed by Mr Balfour, the new Prime Minister, never had a fair chance. He succeeded only in an exhausted inheritance. Indeed, his wisest course would have been to get out of office as decently, as quickly, and above all, as quietly as possible. He could, with great propriety, have declared that the 1900 Parliament had been elected on war conditions and on a war issue, that the war was now finished successfully, that the mandate was exhausted, and that he must recur to the sense of the electors before proceeding further with his task. No doubt the Liberals would have come into power, but not by a large majority, and they would have been forced by a strong, united Conservative opposition, which in four or five years, about 1907, would have resumed effective control of the state. 
The solid ranks of Conservative members, who acclaimed Mr Balfour's accession as First Minister, were, however, in no mood to be dismissed to their constituencies when the Parliament was only two years old and had still four or five years more to run. Mr Balfour therefore addressed himself to the duties of government with a serene indifference, to the vast alienation of public opinion and the consolidation of hostile forces which were proceeding all around him. Mr Chamberlain, his almost all-powerful lieutenant, was under no illusions. He felt with an acute political sensitivity the ever-growing strength of the tide setting against the ruling combination. But instead of pursuing courses of moderation and prudence, he was impelled by the ardour of his nature to a desperate remedy. The government was reproached with being reactionary. The moderate Conservatives and the younger Conservatives were all urging liberal and conciliatory processes. The opposition was advancing hopefully towards power, heralded by a storm of angry outcry. He would show them, and show doubting of weary friends as well, how it was possible to quell indignation by violence, and from the very heart of reaction, to draw the means of popular victory, he unfurled the flag of protection. The End of an Epoch Time, adversity, and the recent Education Act had united the Liberals. Protection, or tariff reform as it was called, split the Conservatives. Ultimately, six ministers resigned, and 50 Conservative or Unionist members definitely withdrew their support from the government. Among them were a number of those younger men from whom a party should derive new force and driving power, and who were especially necessary to it during a period of opposition. The action of the free trade unionists were endorsed indirectly by Lord Salisbury himself. From his retirement, and was actively sustained by such pillars of the Unionist party as Sir Michael Hicks Beach and the Duke of Devonshire, no such formidable loss has been sustained by the Conservative Party since the expulsion of the Peerlites. But if Mr Balfour had not felt inclined to begin his reign by an act of abdication, he was still less disposed to have power wrested from his grasp. Moreover, he regarded a party split as the worst of domestic catastrophes, and responsibility for it as the unforgivable sin. He therefore laboured with amazing patience and coolness to preserve a semblance of unity, to calm the tempest, and to hold on as long as possible in the hope of its subsiding. With the highest subtlety and ingenuity, he devised a succession of formulas designed to enable people who differed profoundly to persuade themselves they were in agreement. When it came to the resignation of ministers, he was careful to shed free trade and protectionist blood as far as possible in equal quantities. Like Henry VIII, he decapitated papists and burned hot gospelers on the same day their respective divergencies in opposite directions from his central, personal and artificial compromise. Fall of the Conservative Government In this unpleasant situation, Mr Balfour maintained himself for two whole years. Vain the clamour for a general election, vain the taunts of clinging to office, vain the solicitations of friends and the attempts of foes to force a crucial issue. The Prime Minister himself remained immovable, inexhaustible, imperturbable, and he remained Prime Minister. His clear, just mind, detached from small things, stood indifferent to the clamour about him. He pursued through the critical period of the Russo-Japanese War a policy in support of Japan of the utmost firmness. He resisted all temptations. On the other hand, to make the sinking of our trawlers on the Dogger Bank by the Russian fleet an occasion of war with Russia. He formed the Committee of Imperial Defence, the instrument of our preparedness. He carried through the agreement with France of 1904. But in 1905, political Britain cared for none of these things. The credit of the government fell steadily. The process of degeneration in the Conservative Party was continuous. The storm of opposition grew unceasingly and so did the unification of all the forces opposed to the dying regime. The General Election of 1906 Late in November 1905, Mr Balfour tendered his resignation as Prime Minister to the King. The government of Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman was formed, and proceeded in January to appeal to the constituencies. This government represented both the wings into which the Liberal Party had been divided by the Boer War. The liberal imperialists, so distinguished by their talents, filled with some of the greatest offices, 
Mr Asquith went to the Exchequer, Sir Edward Grey to the Foreign Office, Mr Haldane became Secretary of War. On the other hand, the Prime Minister, who himself represented the mainstream of Liberal opinion, appointed Sir Robert Reid Lord Chancellor, and Mr John Morley Secretary of State for India. Both these statesmen, while not opposing actual war measures in South Africa, had unceasingly condemned the war. And in Mr Lloyd George and Mr John Burns, both of whom entered the Cabinet, were found democratic politicians who had grown even further. The dignity of the administration was enhanced by the venerable figures of Lord Ripon, Sir Henry Fowler, and the newly returned Viceroy of India, Lord Elgin. The results of the polls in January 1906 was a conservative landslide. Never since the election following the Great Reform Bill had anything comparable occurred in British parliamentary history. In Manchester, for instance, which was one of the principal battlegrounds, Mr Balfour and eight Conservative colleagues were dismissed and replaced by nine Liberals or Labour men. The Conservatives, after nearly 20 years of power, crept back to the House of Commons, barely 150 strong. The Liberals had gained a majority of more than 100 over all other parties combined. Both great parties harboured deep grievances against each other, and against the wrong of the Khaki election and its misuse was set the counterclaim of an unfair Chinese labour cry. The Algiers Conference Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman was still receiving the resounding acclamations of liberals, peace lovers, anti-jingos and anti-militarists in every part of the country, when he was summoned by Sir Edward Grey to attend to business of a very different character. The Algiers Conference was in its throes. When the Anglo-French agreement in Egypt and Morocco had first ever been known, the German government accepted the situation without protest or complaint. The German Chancellor, Prince Bülow, had even declared in 1904 that there was nothing in the agreement to which Germany could take exception. What appears to be before us is the attempt by the method of friendly understanding to eliminate a number of points of difference which exist between England and France. We have no objection to make against these from the standpoint of German interest. A serious agitation, most embarrassing to the German government, was, however, set on foot by the pan-German and colonial parties. Under this pressure, the attitude of the government changed, and a year later, Germany openly challenged the agreement and looked about for an opportunity to assert her claims in Morocco. This opportunity was not long delayed. Early in 1905, a French mission arrived in Fez. Their language and actions seemed to show an intention of treating Morocco as a French protectorate, thereby ignoring the international obligations of the Treaty of Madrid. The Sultan of Morocco appealed to Germany, asking if France was authorised to speak in the name of Europe. Germany was now enabled to advance as the champion of an international agreement, which she suggested France was violating. Behind this lay the clear intention to show France that she could not afford in consequence of her agreement with Britain to offend Germany. The action taken was of the most drastic character. The German emperor was persuaded to go to Tangiers, and there, against his better judgment, on March 31st, 1905, he delivered, in very uncompromising language, chosen by his ministers, an open challenge to France. To this speech, the widest circulation was given by the German Foreign Office. Hot foot upon it, two very threatening dispatches were sent to Paris and London, demanding a conference of all the signatory powers to the Treaty of Madrid. Every means was used by Germany to make France understand that if she refused the conference, there would be war, and to make assurance doubly sure, a special envoy was sent from Berlin to Paris for that express purpose. France was quite unprepared for war. Her army was in a bad state. Russia was incapacitated. Moreover, France had not a good case. The French foreign minister, Monsieur Delcasse, was however unwilling to give way. The German attitude became still more threatening, and on June the 6th, the French cabinet of Monsieur Rouvier, unanimously, almost at the cannon's mouth, accepted the principle of a conference, and Monsieur Delcasse at once resigned. So far, Germany had been very successful. Under a direct threat of war, she had compelled France to bow to her will, and to sacrifice the minister who had negotiated the agreement with Great Britain. The Rouvier cabinet sought earnestly for some friendly solution, 
which, while sparing France a humiliation of a conference dictated in every circumstance, would secure substantial concessions to Germany. The German government were, however, determined to exploit their victory to the full and not to make the situation easier for France, either before or during the conference. The conference accordingly assembled at Algeciras in January 1906. Anglo-French military conversations Great Britain now appeared on the scene, apparently quite unchanged and unperturbed by her domestic convulsions. She had in no way encouraged France to refuse the conference. But if a war was to be fastened on France by Germany, as a direct result of an agreement made recently in the full light of day between France and Great Britain, it was held that Great Britain could not remain indifferent. Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman therefore authorised Sir Edward Grey to support France strongly at Algeciras. He also authorised, almost as the first act, of what was to be an era of peace, retrenchment and reform, the beginning of military conversations between the British and French general staff, with a view to concerted action in the event of war. This was a step of profound significance and of far-reaching reactions. Henceforward, the relations of the two staffs became increasingly intimate and confidential. The minds of our military men were definitely turned into a particular channel. Mutual trust grew continually in one set of military relationships, mutual precautions in the other. However explicitly the two governments might agree and affirm to each other that no national or political engagement was involved in these technical discussions, the fact remained that they constituted an exceedingly potent tie. The attitude of Great Britain at Algeciras turned the scale against Germany. Russia, Spain and other signatory powers associated themselves with France and England. Austria revealed to Germany the limits beyond which she would not go. Thus Germany found herself isolated, and what she had gained by her threats of war evaporated at the council board. In the end, a compromise suggested by Austria enabled Germany to withdraw without open loss of dignity. From these events, however, serious consequences flowed. Both the two systems into which Europe was divided were crystallised and consolidated. Germany felt the need of binding Austria more closely to her. Her open attempt to terrorise France had produced a deep impression upon French public opinion. An immediate and thorough reform of the French army was carried out, and the Entente with England was strengthened and confirmed. Algeciras was a milestone on the road to Armageddon. Mr Asquith's administration The illness and death of Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman at the beginning of 1908 opened the way for Mr Asquith. The Chancellor of the Exchequer had been the first lieutenant of the late Prime Minister and, as his chief strength failed, had more and more assumed the burden. He had charged himself with the conduct of the new licensing bill, which was to be the staple of the session of 1908 and in virtue of this task he could command the allegiance of an extreme and doctrinaire section of his party from whom his imperialism had previously alienated him. He resolved to ally to himself the democratic gifts and rising reputation of Mr Lloyd George. Thus the succession passed smoothly from hand to hand. Mr Asquith became Prime Minister, Mr Lloyd George became Chancellor of the Exchequer, and the second man in the government. The new cabinet, like the old, was a veiled coalition. A very distinct line of cleavage was maintained between the radical, pacifist elements who had followed Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman and constituted the bulk both of the cabinet and the party on the one hand and the liberal imperialist wing on the other. Mr Asquith, as Prime Minister, had now to take an impartial position, but his heart and sympathies were always with Sir Edward Grey, the War Office and the Admiralty and on every important occasion when he was forced to reveal himself, he definitely sided with them. He was not, however, able to give Sir Edward Grey the same effectual countenance, much as he might wish to do so, that Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman had done. The old chief's word was law to the extremists of his party. They would accept almost anything from him. They were quite sure he would do nothing more in matters of foreign policy and defence than was absolutely necessary and that he would do it in the manner least calculated to give satisfaction to jingo sentiments. Mr Asquith, however, had been far from sound about the Boer War, and was the lifelong friend of the Foreign Secretary, 
who had wandered even further from the straight path into patriotic pastures. He was therefore in a certain sense suspect, and every step he took in external affairs was watched with prim vigilance by the elders. If the military conversations with France had not been authorised by Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, and if his political virtue could not be cited in their justification, I doubt whether they could have been begun or continued by Mr Asquith. Since I have crossed the floor of the House in 1904 on the free trade issue, I had worked in close political association with Mr Lloyd George. He was the first to welcome me. We sat and acted together in a period of opposition preceding Mr Balfour's fall, and we had been in close accord during Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman's administration, and which I had served as Under Secretary of State for the Colonies. This association continued when I entered the new cabinet as President of the Board of Trade, and in general, though from different angles, we leaned to the side of those who had restrained the forward parts in both foreign policy and in armaments. It must be understood that these differences of attitude and complexion, which in varying forms reproduce themselves in every great and powerful British administration, in no way prevented harmonious and agreeable relations between the principal personages, and our affairs proceeded amid many amenities in an atmosphere of courtesy, friendliness and goodwill. The Austrian Annexations It was not long before the next European crisis arrived. On October 5th, 1908, Austria, without warning or parley, proclaimed the annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. These provinces of the Turkish Empire had been administered by her under the Treaty of Berlin in 1878, and the annexation only declared in form what already existed in fact. The Young Turk Revolution, which had occurred in the summer, seemed to Austria likely to lead to a reassertion of Turkish sovereignty over Bosnia and Herzegovina, and this she was concerned to forestall. A reasonable and patient diplomacy would probably have secured for Austria the easements which she needed. Indeed, negotiations with Russia, the great power most interested, had made favourable progress. But suddenly and abruptly, Count Arenfall, the Austrian foreign minister, interrupted the discussions by the announcement of the annexation before the arrangements for a suitable concession to Russia had been concluded. By this essentially violent act, a public affront was put upon Russia, and a personal slight upon the Russian negotiator, Monsieur Ivolsky. A storm of anger and protest arose on all sides. England, basing herself on the words of the London Conference in 1871, that it is an essential principle of the laws of nations that no power can free itself from the engagements of a treaty, nor modify its stipulations except by consent of the contracting parties, refused to recognise either the annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina or the declaration of Bulgarian independence which had synchronised with it. Turkey protested loudly against a lawless act. An effective boycott of Austrian merchandise was organised by the Turkish government. The Serbians mobilised their army, but it was the effect on Russia which was most serious. The bitter animosity excited against Austria throughout Russia became a penultimate cause of the Great War. In this national quarrel, the personal differences of Ehrenfall and Izvolsky played also their part. Great Britain and Russia now demanded a conference, declining meanwhile to countenance what had been done. Austria, supported by Germany, refused. The danger of some violent action on the part of Serbia became acute. Sir Edward Grey, after making it clear that Great Britain would not be drawn into a war on a Balkan quarrel, laboured to restrain Serbia, to pacify Turkey, and to give full diplomatic support to Russia. The German Threat to Russia The controversy dragged on until April 1909, when it was ended in the following remarkable manner. The Austrians had determined, unless Serbia recognised the annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, to send an ultimatum and declare war upon her. At this point, the German Chancellor, Prince von Bülow, intervened. Russia, he insisted, should herself advise Serbia to give way. The powers should officially recognise the annexation, without a conference being summoned, and without any kind of compensation to Serbia. Russia was to give her consent to this action, without previously informing the British or French governments. If Russia did not consent, Austria would declare war on Serbia with the full 
and complete support of Germany. Russia, thus nakedly confronted by war, both with Austria and Germany, collapsed under the threat, as France had done three years before. England was left an isolated defender of the sanctity of treaties and the law of nations. The Teutonic triumph was complete. But it was a victory gained at a perilous cost. France, after her treatment in 1905, had begun a thorough military reorganisation. Now Russia in 1910 made an enormous increase in her already vast army. And both Russia and France, smarting under similar experiences, closed their ranks cemented their alliance, and set to work to construct with Russian labour and French money the new strategic railway systems of which Russia's western frontier stood in need. It was next the turn of Great Britain to feel the pressure of the German power. The Admiralty Programme of 1909 In the spring of 1909, the First Lord of the Admiralty, Mr McKenna, suddenly demanded the construction of no less than six dreadnought battleships. He based this claim on the rapid growth of the German fleet and its expansion and acceleration upon the new naval law of 1908, which was causing the Admiralty the greatest anxiety. I was still a sceptic about the danger of the European situation and not convinced by the Admiralty case. In conjunction with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I proceeded at once to canvass the scheme and to examine the reasons by which it was supported. The conclusions which we both reached was that a programme of four ships would sufficiently meet our needs. In this process, I was led to analyse minutely the character and composition of the British and German navies, actual and prospective. I could not agree with the Admiralty contention that a dangerous situation would be reached in the year 1912. I found the Admiralty figures on this subject were exaggerated. I did not believe that the Germans were building dreadnoughts secretly in excess of their published fleet laws. I held that our margin in pre-dreadnought ships would, added to a new programme of four dreadnoughts, assure us an adequate superiority in 1912, the danger year, as it was then called. In any case, as the Admiralty only claimed to lay down the fifth and sixth ships in the last month of the financial year, i.e. March 1910, these could not affect the calculations. The Chancellor of the Exchequer and I therefore proposed that four ships should be sanctioned for 1909, and that the additional two should be considered in relation to the programme of 1910. Looking back on the voluminous papers of this controversy in the light of what actually happened, there can be no doubt whatever that so far as facts and figures were concerned, we were strictly right. The gloomy Admiralty anticipations were in no respect fulfilled in the year 1912. The British margin was found to be ample in that year, there were no secret German dreadnoughts, nor had Admiral von Tirpitz made any untrue statement in respect to major construction. The dispute in the cabinet gave rise to a fierce agitation outside. The process of the controversy led to a sharp rise of temperature. The actual points in dispute never came to an issue. Genuine alarm was excited throughout the country by what was for the first time widely recognised as a German menace. In the end, a curious and characteristic solution was reached. The Admiralty had demanded six ships, the Economist offered four, and we finally compromised on eight. However, five out of the eight were not ready before the danger year of 1912 had passed peacefully away. But although the Chancellor of the Exchequer and I were right in the narrow sense, we were absolutely wrong in relation to the deep tides of destiny. The greatest credit is due to the First Lord of the Admiralty, Mr McKenna, for the resolute and courageous manner in which he fought his case and withstood his party on this occasion. Little did I think, at this dispute proceeded, that when the next cabinet crisis about the Navy arose, our roles would be reversed. And little did he think that the ships for which he contended so stoutly would eventually, when they arrived, be welcomed with open arms by me. The Growth of the German Navy Whatever differences might be entertained about the exact number of ships required in a particular year, the British nation in general became conscious of the undoubted fact that Germany proposed to reinforce her unequalled army by a navy, which in 1920 would be far stronger than anything up to the present possessed by Great Britain. To the Navy Law of 1910 had succeeded the amending measure of 1906, 
and upon the increases of 1906, had followed those of 1908. In a flamboyant speech at Rival in 1904, the German emperor had already styled himself the Admiral of the Atlantic. All sorts of sober-minded people in England began to be profoundly disquieted. What did Germany want this great navy for? Against whom, except us, could she measure it, match it or use it? There was a deep and growing feeling, no longer confined to political and diplomatic circles, that the Prussians meant mischief, that they envied the splendour of the British Empire, and that if they saw a good chance at our expense, they would take full advantage of it. Moreover, it began to be realised that it was no use trying to turn Germany from her course by abstaining from countermeasures. Reluctance on our part to build ships was attributed in Germany to want of national spirit, and as another proof that the virile race should advance to replace the effect over civilised and passive society which was no longer capable of sustaining its great place in the world's affairs. No one could run his eyes down the series of figures of British and German construction for the first three years of the Liberal administration without feeling in presence of a dangerous, if not malignant, design. In 1905, Britain built four ships and Germany two. In 1906, Britain decreased her programme to three ships and Germany increased her programme to three ships. In 1907, Britain further decreased her programme to two ships and Germany further increased hers to four. These figures are monumental. It was impossible to resist the conclusion, gradually forced on nearly everyone, that if the British Navy lagged behind, the gap would be speedily filled. The inheritance of the new German Chancellor We have now seen how within the space of five years, Germany's policy and the growth of her armaments led her to arouse and alarm, most profoundly, three of the greatest powers in the world. Two of them, France and Russia, had been forced to bow to the German will by a plain threat of war. Each had been quelled by the open intention of a neighbour to use force against them to the utmost limit without compunction. Both felt they had escaped a bloody ordeal and probable disaster only by submission. The sense of past humiliation was aggravated by the fear of future affronts. The third power, unorganised for war, but inaccessible and not to be neglected in the world's affairs, Britain, had also been made to feel that hands were being laid upon the very foundation of her existence. Swiftly, surely, methodically, a German navy was coming into being at our doors, which must expose us to dangers, only to be warded off by strenuous exertions and by a vigilance almost as tense as that of actual war. As France and Russia increased their armies, so Britain, under the same pressure, increased her fleet. Henceforward, the three disquieted nations will act more closely together and will not be taken by their adversary one by one. Henceforward, their military arrangements will be gradually concerted. Henceforward, they will consciously be facing a common danger. Ah, foolish, diligent Germans working so hard, thinking so deeply, marching and countermarching on the parade grounds of the fatherland, poring over long calculations, fuming in newfound prosperity, discontented amid the splendour of mundane success. How many bulwarks to your peace and glory did you not, with your own hands, successively tear down? In the year 1909, writes von Bethmann Holweg, then the successor of Prince von Bülow, the situation was based on the fact that England had firmly taken its stand on the side of France and Russia in pursuit of its traditional policy of opposing whatever continental power for the time being was the strongest and that Germany held fast to its naval programme, had given a definite direction to its eastern policy, and had moreover to guard against the French antagonism that in no ways been mitigated by its policy in later years. And that Germany held fast to its naval programme, had given a definite direction to its eastern policy, and had moreover to guard against the French antagonism that in no ways been mitigated by its policy in later years. And if Germany saw a formidable aggravation of all the aggressive tendencies of Franco-Russian policy in England's pronounced friendship with this dual alliance, England on its side had grown to see a menace in the strengthening of the German fleet and a violation of its ancient rights in our eastern policy. Words had already passed on both sides. The atmosphere was chilly and clouded with distrust. Such in his own words was the inheritance 
of the new German Chancellor. He was now to make his own contribution to the anxieties of the world.